Welcome back to Finnegan's Take. This is Conversation 4. Jerry moves from District 7 to the TAC team, a journey that moves him closer to special operations. Let's discuss that time when you're still in the 7th District and you want to move to a tactical team. How did that come about? I saw the guys there that were working in that capacity. Their assignment was tactical officer. I was attracted to that type of work because although you were on the TAC team, you weren't tied down to the radio, but yet you were officially. So if they ran out of beat cars to respond to, to the calls, like especially a calls for service or hot calls, like you know, a man with a gun or a person shot, property crime in progress. And if there were not any beat cars available, they would start banging, which banging is a term that they're calling you on the radio. So they would start banging the tech cars. 99% of the time, none of the tech cars would answer up because they knew it was a radio call. They didn't want to be bothered. They wanted to do their own thing and they were supposed to be out there doing. What do you mean they want to answer the call? How did it rise to the level where you had to answer the call? Generally, the cars won't answer because they're out there hunting for activity. They don't want to handle a domestic call. They want to get somebody with a gun or they want to get somebody to sell and dope. What they'll do is they resort to the second call, which would be they'll call for a tactical supervisor in the 7th District. They'll say, 769, do you have one of your cars available that can take suspicious person call? Yeah, all my cars are on squad. I'll call any car on my team. But if they call you, you got to answer. And then they say, can you handle a suspicious person 7218 South David? Okay, well, we'll, we'll let you know. Get a description. What's the guy doing or what's the person doing, the woman or whatever. And then you go over there, and if you don't find that person, you give them a code. And that means you use that code, and then they say there's no one there. The offender's gone when you arrive. Generally, they try as a last resort to call the TAC guys to help. In those busy districts, it gets so busy that they run out of cars. So they have no choice but to, to rely on TAC cars. And if the TAC cars are tied up, they'll ask for a supervisor. So a sergeant will come up, and then someone will always back them up because they're not going to let a sergeant go by himself. So somebody will say, hey, squad, take us off lunch. We're finished. You know, we're heading to back up 710 on that job. You're not going to let a one-man car go over to a man with a gun call. The chances of a sergeant coming across somebody shooting a gun on the street or somebody running with a gun, it's very great because those sergeants, for the most part, are driving up and down these side streets just like the beat cars are. So they're not driving around with blinders on. And they're looking for activity, too, because that's what they're out there to do. They're the police. You would not want them to act on their own, but they do. A lot of guys, like I told you previously about Jim Dignan or Bill Whalahan, those guys, they were the police. Just like when I went to special operations and gangs, those sergeants would do the same thing because that's what police did in Chicago. So the difference between the police in a district and this TAC unit is the TAC unit is plain clothes police officers, but every day their mission is to go out and specifically get guns and drugs off the street and or look for crime that's happening. But do they have more leeway to move within a district? Tactical teams are assigned, like a sergeant, a lieutenant will tell tactical team. They'll try not to tie them down to a specific area of the district, but they will sometimes generally tell like a certain team handle the 10 sector or handle the 20 sector. You're driving an unmarked car in plain clothes, which is not undercover because when you work in these neighborhoods, these children see the police on a continual basis. So a three-year-old or a four-year-old out playing in a group or standing there by their porch are going to wave to you because they know you're the police. You're not fooling anybody. Little children that are three and four years old, they know who the police, and they'll tell you, they'll say, hi, police. And I'm not trying to be funny, but you get two white guys driving around, you got black vest covers on and t-shirts and gym shoes and jeans, and you got your gun exposed and your handcuffs. You're not fooling anybody. Everybody knows who you are. Everybody. Inglewood was a predominantly black neighborhood. You got some tech guys that sometimes we do reverse things like on drug locations and you put the black tactical officers in a gangway, and then you'd have a couple black officers acting as lookouts and security, and they would send prospective buyers down the gangway to the tactical officer, and when they would try to purchase drugs, then you would arrest them, and then they put them in a wagon on the next block, and then you get so many, you take them in. 
And they would have these reverse things. They were called, I mean, it was a waste of time. All you were doing is arresting the buyers. You might have disrupted the sales on that block for a couple hours. It truly was a waste of manpower. It was very ineffective because if they didn't buy on that block, they'd go three blocks over and buy on that block. The tag team had its perks, but I did not have the opportunity to get on the tag team at that time. So I started looking for other opportunities, and one of them was Gang Crimes. And then Gang Crimes South, which is at 51st and Wentworth, Gang Crimes West, which was at Harrison and Kedzie, and Gang Crimes North, which was at Belmont and Western. You had an opportunity to go and work in that unit, and that was a citywide unit. At that time, it wasn't Gang Crimes, it was a citywide unit, but you basically worked in the area you were assigned to. So if you were in the Area 4 on the Gang Crimes West, you worked all the Area 4 districts, the west side. If you were in Area 1, you would work all the south side districts. Same thing with the north side. But there was a program that came into play in the early 90s. There was a commander. His name was Bob Dart. And he convinced the superintendent of police at that time that there should be something called the Flying Squad. And the Flying Squad started in the 20s, like motorcycle cops. What this was, you'd have three or four teams of 10-man teams and a sergeant and then a lieutenant, and you would go and saturate a district every night. But the funniest thing about it is you let them know you're coming. They'd line us up, like say we meet at a school parking lot. We were all in marked cars, and we had a wagon with us. And they'd have us put our lights on and our siren and drive down the street let them know the flying squad was in their district. It was the craziest thing. Shows What's the their, psychology behind that? Their thing was that they wanted to let the citizens know that there was a big police presence in their district, that we were addressing their concerns. So we brought in this outside unit, the flying squad, to come in there and supplement the district police. So we would come in there and basically try to get the guys that were selling dope or carrying guns or robbing people or robbing stores. It was actually kind of exciting because you got to go somewhere different every night. But there was a drawback to that because if you weren't familiar with that district, you had to rely on the number street. We say the South Siders are idiots because we have all the numbered streets. So you would have to rely on the numbered streets. They're all the same. 75th, 75th place, 80th, 81st place. When you get these streets that you're not familiar with, like on the Southeast side, some of these streets, I had never even heard of them. I'd never been that far east of the city in my life. We're basically like a couple blocks from Lake Michigan, but as far south as you can go, like right on the Indiana border. It took some time to get used to that, but once you, you know, got used to the hot spots, you would hit the same hot spots all the time. Actually, our unit, that flying squad, was very productive. How effective yes. was this methodology? It was very good. It was very good. It took a lot of guns off the street. You run people's names. You got a lot of people wanted for serious warrants not BS traffic stuff they were wanted for them. That's a waste of time. 99% of the time, if I had to run it over here, then you have to take them in. But I didn't take people in for traffic violations and warrants for traffic because to me, that was a waste of my time. It was a very effective unit, and I think the results were good. I don't understand why they disbanded it. Eventually, they disbanded it. Maybe the manpower came into play. After that, I was in Gang Crimes West, was out of Harrison and Kedzie. And there was a lot of activity out there. We, we made a lot of good arrests, a lot of guns. The 10th District, the 11th District, the 12th District, and the 13th District were Area 4. 10 and 11 kept you, kept you hopping. How does that work? You apply to go to this gang unit, and you just put your name in? And then what, they just like review it and go, oh, yeah, you've got some tread and experience in the 7th. So then they accept you into this unit. Do you have to train when you get in that unit? Like, is there a pause in your policing? How does that work? That's what I did. I applied. There's an application. I interviewed with a captain on the south side for Gang South. His name was Duffy. Seemed like a straight shooter. I told him about my activity and my partner's activity. And I said, you know, we're aggressive, which meant we like to go out and work. We're young. We like to give it a try here and go out here and get the bad guys for you. Get a little freedom on the other hand, you know, instead of being tied down to the radio. And he goes, okay, we'll let you know. We do have opening by what you said. I do like conversation as far as your activity goes. I'll get back to you. I'll let you know. But he never did. I know how the police department and any other city job works. You have to have a phone call. And by that, I mean you have to call somebody, either politically or on the police department, who's a boss, to get you moved to a unit like that. That's not a district. That's called a unit. Anytime you leave a district, it's a unit. So 
that didn't happen for us. A friend of mine was a big precinct captain in the 11th Ward. He took me to see the aldermen with my partner. At that time, it was Pat Hules. He assured us that he would make the phone call, take care of it. This is the mayor's alderman. So we're like, we're done. You know, we're going there. And it never materialized. But I know that the reason it didn't is because I never, I've only voted for Daly. I was the only Democratic person I've ever voted for in my life. So they probably looked at my voting record, which rest is sure they do. I want to mine yeah. into that a yeah. moment. We both know Chicago and probably every other city on the globe works. It's a patronage process. We've talked about this a little bit in the past that really to work your way up the ranks, you got to be inside. Politically. Yes, connected to the machine. And we all know Chicago is just a Byzantine wild hall of mirrors when it comes to politics and paybacks and favors and et cetera. So you go to this guy, Huel. Huel is Daly's guy. Huels. 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 H-U-E-L-S is his name. I'm reading a trib. Right. I'm reading a Tribune article exactly. right now from 1990. Yeah, he, re- he, re- he had yeah. to resign. Yeah, 97 yeah. he had to resign. So you go to him. Daly's the only person you voted for that's a Democrat. In my life. And so this guy looks at your voting record, you assume, which is probably very common, and sees that you vote R most of the time. You feel like that that's why he never called you back. Of course. I had worked an election. First time I worked, I was 18 years old. I worked for Ronald Reagan against Walter Mondale. I had a disagreement with one of the Greens, Bobby Green, and he is Rich Daly's first cousin. And it almost led to a fist fight. I mean, I almost got a fist fight over it. And he told people, don't pay attention to me, don't listen to me, he kind of swore back and forth at each other. How many people yeah, voted so for Mondale? I don't even think the state of Illinois yeah. voted for Mondale, did they? Reagan pummeled them. Pummeled them. Yeah, he won every he state except Illinois. he won every state except Minnesota. He carried, he carried Illinois three to one, a democratic state. Three to one. This guy was getting hot, so I come walking up there and he sees me. They call him palm cards. It says Reagan on there, vote, whatever number he was at that time. He goes, uh, who are you working for? And I go, I'm working for Ronald Reagan. And he goes, oh, who the fuck are you working for? And I go, oh, who the fuck are you? So he goes on to say, hey, pal, you know, you don't know who you're fucking with, this and that. So I told him, I said, I really don't give a fuck who you are, okay? I'm here. I'm working for Ronald Reagan to be the president. And you don't like it, that's your problem. He goes, well, we'll see. I go, okay, you, you, got, a, you got an issue with that? I said, we'll settle it. You know, I'm 19 years old at the time, 18, 19 years old. I'm pretty good shape. Young. I'm not afraid of this guy. This guy's probably in his 40s by that time. Not a big guy at all, but he's, you know, he's running his mouth all the time. So he says, yeah, I'll get a couple guys over and, you know, you'll get a beat. And I says, that's no problem. I said, I'll get my brothers over and we'll return the beating. So back and forth, back and forth, talking to people like right in front of me, but about me. I'm handing the people a card. Someone would take them, some wouldn't them because they were probably, you know, hacks that had city jobs from the Democratic ward there. Are you at a polling place? Yeah. Yep, I was at 33rd in line. This guy is telling me, your fucking guy's a loser. Don't worry about it, pal. He's all this and that. So I just told him. So he tries to get the judges to come out. Where's your poll credentials? I go, they're in there. I turned them in. So now he comes out. Oh, uh, Jerry Finnegan, huh? I go, yeah. I go, I'll go in there and find out your name. So I don't give a fuck what you do. I say, yeah, you don't scare me. You can keep running your mouth. I don't care what you want to do. The end of the night comes. And they do the, they start counting the vote. Probably be within about 40 minutes, he can see that Reagan is stomping Mondale, stomping him. Now he's, he's really getting shitty. His mood's really turning because his guy's a loser. That was the end of it. So I'm sure when he went back to the ward, he probably asked about me in the ward office. And he probably told them I was out there working for Reagan and didn't see it. But I'm sure they had a vote that they kept people's names in, pre-computers. So it comes down to it. I think Hughes probably looked it up and saw my name in that book, I'm sure. I never got a call. But I talked to my sister. Her brother-in-law at that time was a police commander, but I did not ask him to help me. But my sister knew another police commander. Actually, he wasn't a commander. He was a deputy chief in the detective division. John Stibich, he's since passed away. Very pleasant guy. She knew him through her brother-in-law and being at parties and stuff like that. Now, she asked if he could do anything for me. I got sent to Gang Crimes West. I got a call to come into the office. I went into the office. They told me that I was going to be on the transfer order to go to Unit 740, which was Gang Crimes West at that time. That's what ended up happening. I ended up getting in Gang Crimes. And then you see people there you worked with in Seven and other places. That's how they got there. 
it's a phone call, inner department from a boss or a political politician calls and gets it done through city hall through the police department. That's how it works in the police department and the fire department and other, every other city department. How many years are you into your policing career now? Um, two years, two years I made. So I came out of the academy in April of 89. I went to Gang Crimes West in April of 91. And were you ready? Uh, of course, I felt I was ready. Cocky. Was in the 7th District, fast, saw murderers, chased guys with guns, made arrests for guys with guns, people shooting somebody else, hot cars. So, I mean, that's what they did, and I felt I was ready. If I was able to do that in the 7th District, I was definitely able to do it in gang crimes. It was apples to apples in terms of the environment or what you were doing day to day. So seven was as, yes. was extreme in comparison to most places in Chicago, and this shift was also extreme. Yes. In the tenth, the north end of the tenth district, a lot of gang activity in ten down in the south end, the Mexican gangs, and in the north end, it was the black gangs because it borders the eleventh district, the south end of eleven, and eleven was just like seven, wide open, shooting after shooting, robbery, murder, was just learning the streets over there, and it was fun. Great group of guys we had in the unit. Good sergeants and the lieutenants were good people. Captain, uh, no, didn't know the guy. It wasn't very personable. Didn't make a difference. Just as long as I did my job, I wouldn't have any issue. When you go there and you start, is there a mission statement or is it just you jump in and you just kind of figure it out and there's so much going on already that you just acclimate to what's happening? Yeah. So the activity and the work were one and the same. The only thing was you got to eat in places that you chose to eat in and weren't only stuck at these certain locations. So you had some freedom if you wanted to run. Like say, for instance, if I forgot an extra battery for my rechargeable flashlight, I could run home and get another battery without getting on the radio and asking permission. It was good, but the thing I found crazy about it was, and I didn't complain about it, neither did anybody else, but there was a point system there. Every arrest at that time in that unit had a numeric value. There's deniability. They would say that never existed, but it existed. And we would joke, it's like fucking winning the lottery. You get a car full of gangbangers, you get a gun in there, and you get some fucking spray paint and a fucking marker and a curfew violator, you fucking won the lottery. That's big points, man. And how was this posted? It was in the the outer office where we came in and out. At that time, we were in the 11th district, and we had an office in the back for administrative staff. And then we had a small office for the sergeants and then a general office, which was not very big. So when we relocated, when they changed it to special operations and we moved to Holman Square, which was the old Sears warehouse, uh, was huge and had multiple units housed there. But at that time in 11, it was so fucking crowded. It was posted on the wall in the outer office and every period you would see where you finished. Was there a shadow system? If you killed somebody, did you get points? Or if you beat somebody up did you get points no no uh -uh. if you killed somebody neil i mean i don't care what someone could say i've never been in that situation but uh, i knew a couple guys who had killed people on the job and it affected them it caused them it's a proven fact it changes somebody whether that guy is trying to hurt you or not you still took somebody's life he's a shitbag and got what he deserved but seen some guys turn into boozing when they killed people Maybe they couldn't sleep at night. I don't know, even though they were 100% in the right. Just strange circumstance. Uh, but no, no, that that was never, never part of the uh, system. You weren't given points to beat somebody up. I mean, otherwise, there would have been a lot of points in that unit. Every month, you were ranked out of the personnel in that unit. And you had to be ranked above a certain number. If you were in that lower bottom number continually, you got launched. They got rid of you, unless you were super heavy. You got a gangbanger with a magic marker or a can of spray paint and writing gang graffiti. That was almost as good as getting a gun off the street. It was the craziest thing. Why? It was this point system that they did, Neil. Why was the gangbanger spray painting as valuable as getting a gun off the street? But first, who implemented the point system? And was that Chicago wide in the police department or just something niche inside this unit? And is that frowned upon? No, it wasn't frowned upon. You know, we went out there, worked hard every day, and it was just accepted. You were ranked by your activity every month. You had to produce. 
if you didn't produce, they didn't keep you. So you went out and you got these arrests. You got these arrests for possession of a stolen motor vehicle had a numeric value. I cannot remember the exact point system anymore. But like, say, for instance, you got a guy in a hot car. The driver was worth 10 points. The passengers were worth five points. Would you guys talk this way as you were pursuing a car? Like, oh, there's three guys in there. That's 23 points. Did it become like a video game? No, but after when you went in the station, you'd call in your activity. So say, for instance, you call the desk to get a folder number, which was a case number. So they would write on a manila folder, the little corner slot up there, and they would take a black badge of parker and they'd say, say, for instance, it was 91 the year. They'd put 91-628. So you had case number 91 for that year. You'd have 628 where they can cross-reference that in a big book. And that's how they kept it before the computers. That point system... It would make me laugh because every crime had a point value to it. And some crimes that didn't have point values, then they fell into category that was just like a general three points. That's how you were ranked. There was a person in our unit and she worked in the office. She never worked the street, but she always finished in the top of the rankings because it would later be found out that her boyfriend was one of the biggest leaders of the gangster disciple street gangs. And she would get guns from him and do a weapons turn in. And those points would elevate her in the standings. So she would be up like a 89 percentage or 90 percentage or 91 percent. She'd be in the top five to 10 people every police month because she was getting these guns from her boyfriend. His name was Gregory Shelton. And he was a big big gang leader for the gangster disciple. There's so much good stuff here. Give me a second to unpack this. So sure. This point system is implemented by the hierarchy in this unit. This is not a yes. Chicago wide thing that the police department. That's correct. Let's be clear about this, Neil. The captain who was in charge of our unit gave the marching orders to the lieutenant, but that captain at that time, every gangs West, gang South, gangs North, were all at one time under a captain. And that captain answered to a commander of the gang crimes unit. And the commander of the gang crimes unit answered to the deputy chief of special functions, which gang crimes fell under at that time. So it's not the captain making this up. You had to produce because they don't want you out here driving around wasting gas. Go back to a beat car. Yes, and the point system is pretty obvious, and I want to talk about it more, but I want to go back. Was this frowned upon? I can see in 2023, this would be a massive problem if something like this was going on, for obvious reasons. But at this moment in time, in 1991, was this a frowned upon practice, or was it just out in the open? Was it 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 hidden? It was condoned by the brass. Because, like I said, they wanted to make sure that you produced. But was this common knowledge outside of this group, or was it hidden, or was it just no one gave a shit? It was what it was. The superintendent of police had to know this, Neil. The first deputy superintendent had to know this, okay? You're not going to tell me that a deputy chief makes this up, or a commander makes this up, or a captain. A captain, first of all, that captain knows he's going to have to get called on the carpet. If his unit's not producing, they're going to say, hey, guess what? You're going back to uh, the communication section. That was a nice job. First of all, you got to take home card, captain. Okay? So that captain is going to do what he has to do, keep that car, and have a nice job. He's going to bring the guys he wants in. He's got to eat some guys, they call it. Eat it. You know? You're going to eat a person because... He's got some juice. He gets sent there. And most of the people had juice, so they get sent there. So that captain's got to eat some of these supervisors, which are management. But if this sergeant is is heavy politically, yeah, he's going to be there. And that captain ain't going to do a thing about it because that guy is put there by somebody and it's coming from the fifth floor or some big police boss. And that captain's not going to question it because they're going to say, well, whose guy is this? Uh, that's uh, the 33rd Ward guy. 
So that guy is there. They're not going to push it. The main thing is, like I said, it's the point system. It was the craziest thing, I thought. We would joke, Neil. We would joke about it. Well, what were your feelings about it? Did you like it? I I sense that you're someone that would, you're competitive and you would like that demarcation line. Neil, it did not bother me, not one bit. The only thing that bothered me was how people who worked in the office were rated. They should not have been rated. First of all, they're clerical workers. My joke was always, take the fuck it. And at one time it was, it said patrolman. Then they went to the stars, it said police officer. So I always said, take the hour off of there and just make it police office. Because if you're not working a fucking street, why should you be called a police officer? I'm not saying if a guy was shot or injured, but don't sit there and wear, you know, the gun and the star and fucking walk around and like you're out there doing Tell people, yeah, I'm in special operations or I'm in gang crimes. When you work in the fucking office filing reports. Well, what would be the alternative to have a civilian? I'm not in Chicago, Neil. And I think, you know, some of the departments have that. But Chicago, they had police officers. A lot of guys, they were called light duty. Those guys are deserving of being in the office because they were injured while working as a police officer. So I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about some women who got to those units and then they wormed their way inside because they come in with their nails nice and they don't have to worry about going out there and and fucking wrestling with a bad guy or going in and fucking walking out of a house with fucking roaches on your fucking arms and on your neck because you're just searching the shithole. But they got a nice clean place every day and they could do their shopping on a computer. I used to laugh. There was a guy that worked. I I told this guy one day, he said something about a report missing. And I was like, yeah, yeah, well, I'll I'll get it. Uh, I'll look for it. Okay. Well, I need it today. I go, you know what? Okay. I, all right. Tell them to go fucking solve. If you need it that bad, go fucking look for it for yourself. What are you doing besides sitting on the fucking computer all day? Wearing his gun. And I told him, I said, what are you carrying a gun for in the office? You're worried someone's going to steal your fucking lunch? That really stuck in my car. But So there's this point system. You guys are out there racking numbers. I've got more questions about the point system. And I want to talk specifically about this woman who's feathering in illegal guns from her boyfriend who's a gang member. I want to hear about that. But. When you know this point system, are you like, okay, what's the highest number? Because I'm going to beat it. I was competitive, but you had to be competitive. If you weren't competitive in a unit like that, then some, then you didn't belong there. And the districts, they fucking hated our guts. They hated gang crimes. They hated special operations. Because they felt you were coming in there and you were an interloper. But the thing is, the fucking patch on my shirt, the star on my shirt said the same thing as them. But they had an attitude because I was in there working. I started on a beat car. I didn't consider myself special, but... I like to go balls deep every day, man. I, I just, I don't know what it was until like later in the job. Then I kind of lost a little bit of that. But this woman yeah. who worked in the office was dating uh-huh. a gang member who was at the upper echelon of this. No, he, was, he was a gang leader. Yep. He was the leader. Well, he was one of the top leaders. He might've been the street leader at the time because the guy who was the leader was incarcerated in, in the Illinois state penitentiary at that time. His name was Larry Hoover. It wasn't out there in common knowledge. There was talk, you know, every month, how's she getting fucking 10 guns, turning in 10 guns or 15 guns with no head, which means no rest. It just didn't make any sense. Was that her undoing? Was that the thing that led to the investigation of her? No, no, by far no. Uh, She had a business on 79th Street. It was called Shrimp on the Nine. It ended up, it was tied to the, the FBI, indicted a bunch of the GDs. She was indicted too because uh, she was, you know, washing illicit drug money. And, so uh, was she a spy? I've heard it from other people who work for CPD from uh-huh. decades ago to today that there are people mm-hmm. working on the police force who are, they're spies. They're in gangs, but they're working for CPD. This has been going on, we know, well, since the beginning of chicago policing when the mob used to do this so it's not a new thing that's right do you know or did you think that this is someone who just has another job to collect a paycheck and a pension or was she providing information after finding out that who her boyfriend was i'm sure she was providing information her name was sonia Irwin. she was doing stuff beyond getting guns from them because they indicted her and she went to prison here we go Cop pal of Hoover gang is sentenced. This is the Chicago Tribune by Matt O'Connor, Tribune staff writer, Chicago Tribune, August 12th, 1997. Sonia Irwin, S-O-N-I-A-I-R-W-I-N, a former Chicago police officer once described by her gangster disciple boyfriend as, quote, my ace in the hole, 
unquote, was sentenced to more than 12 years in prison Monday for helping the gang carry out a multi-million dollar drug operation. Interesting. Now, how does someone like that get into that unit? Who instilled her? Why wasn't there a background check? There's no background check to move around on the police department, Neil. It's performed when you apply to the police department, and that's it. I don't know who her clout was to get her into that unit. When I got there, she worked in the office. She worked in the office the whole time. Never worked the street. Just to put a fine point on it, which I think is hilarious, I think, this woman was dating the head of the gangster disciples. She worked in the office as a cop. In order for her to work herself up the point system she would go to her boyfriend he would give her illegal guns she would bring them in and put them into the mix hey i got an illegal gun but at the end of the month she'd have like 10 illegal guns in but she's pushing paper in the office and no one said like what the fuck how did you get these where'd you oh, get these? were you driving oh, to work no. and then you saw the gun on the street corner or like how did you get the gun <laughs> no confidential informant gave it to her somebody was you know concerned citizen confidential informant when the department is so bent on taking the guns off the street, I guess it just fell between the cracks and, you know, they were happy getting a 10 or 15 guns off the street per month from her in addition to the other ones. But it was just fucked up because we'd look at the sheet to see where you landed every quarter. You know, we'd always like, how the fuck is she working in the office, but she's finishing the top of the pack because she's fucking got all these weapons turned in. No one gave a fuck. You're in this unit. Where's your head in terms of how things are going for Jerry Finnegan? Is Chicago the same criminal environment from your perspective from when you first entered the force? Like, what, where are you at emotionally in this journey? It was a continuation, 100 miles an hour plus every day. Great. Loved it. I mean, a lot of action. I was very excited to be in that unit. Uh, and then one of the guys uh, was jammed up and, you know, they arrested him and uh, they disbanded gangs. And when you say jammed up, he was under investigation and... He was indicted. He was sent to a penitentiary in California. They disbanded gangs after that. Are you working gangs when it's disbanded? Yeah. Yes. So what happened was they disbanded it and they were going to rename it. And that's when Special Operations was created. I did not make a phone call. I thought I would be able to stay there because of my activity. I was stupid enough to believe that. I should have made a phone call. I was told you could pick which district you wanted to go to and they would send you there and you'd work on the gang team there. So I said, send me back to seven. So I went back to the seventh district, me and the other guys who got dumped out of gang crimes from South, the only guy from West. So they sent me back to seven and I was on the gang team and I worked for a sergeant over there with a bunch of guys and uh, some good guys on my team. Had a lot of fun there. Got a lot, ton of activity, ton of activity. Took a shitload of guns off the street till I went to special operations. A lot of fun. Some bad dudes there. We put some bad dudes away. A lot of murders, a lot of shootings, robberies. It was, it was pretty interesting. Um, there was one particular case uh, that comes to mind. This guy was killed and he was vice lord leader. And I was walking out of the station and my sergeant was talking to a female police officer. He told me, uh, and I forget the guy's nickname. He said, uh, so-and-so's dead. And I go, oh, yeah, who's that? And he goes, that's the leader of the vice lords. And he goes, Jerry, you're a tactical gang officer. You're supposed to know that. I go, well, that's not my sector. That's a 10 sector. I'm up in the 30 sector. It doesn't make a difference. So he got kind of, you know, pissed off at me because I should have known who, who the guy was. We're going to go over there because it's heated up and we're worried about retaliation. So he gets in the car with me. This kid, Brian Bernard, and uh, another guy, Ed Kozowski, good guys, hard workers. Uh, and I'm driving, and we turn a corner about a half a block from the station. Out of the alley comes a van with its headlights off, so I light them up with my flashlight. It's like a fucking movie. There's a guy in the middle of two other guys, and there's a guy next to him, but the guy in the middle is an old guy, and he's duct taped up, his mouth and his eyes. So we look at each other like, what the fuck? So the van pulls out and takes off on us, so we're chasing them. We get in a chase, probably about a total of about three quarters of a mile. They go into a vacant lot. But the most hilarious thing is both front passenger and side door didn't open. They were broken. So these guys couldn't get out of the van. It was hilarious. They could only get out through the side door. So we got them with the guns, and we got the guy, took the duct tape off of them. And they had kidnapped them, and they were taking them to an ATM, and then they said they were going to kill them afterwards. And this was like 
maybe two weeks after Michael Jordan's father had been killed. That was a great arrest. He should have known better, but figured to help these guys out and give them a ride. They asked for a ride to a gas station. When he got up in the van, they fucking started pistol whipping him and then they duct taped him, fuck him off, taking his ATM card. And the one guy said, we're going to kill this motherfucker when we get his money. He heard him whispering. It was great. We got a department accommodation out of it. That was my first one. We got tons and tons of guns off the street, uh, literally. We got close to 100 guns off the street, probably per individual that year, our first year there. Our- That'd be considered a high number? Oh, yeah. Yeah, extremely, extremely high. Yeah, but that's what they wanted. The guns was a big thing at the time for Mayor Daly, the son, because guns kill people. And there's so many of them. You, for every gun you get, there's another one that replaces instantaneously. It's, it's ridiculous. Went back there, and then they started special operations. And it was a year before I got back there in 94, April of 94. I was called up to my commander's office, Ronnie Watson, who I, I really liked a lot. Always treated me well. Could talk to him. He was a gentleman. He was a gentleman. Uh, he, he ended up going to Cambridge, Massachusetts to be the chief out there. He, he was the police. You know, he was in a jewelry store on the southeast side, got a shootout with a bad guy in there trying to rob the place. And he, he was a good guy. Some guys didn't like him. I thought he was a good boss. His secretary, Teddy Sutherland, a great guy, calls me up there and says the commander wants to see it. I'm like, oh, what the fuck did I do? So I go in there. He says, sit down. He goes, I got a call today about you. And I said, oh, fuck, you know, someone's complaining or something, you know. And he said, the deputy chief, Sherla, called. And uh, he goes, you know, deputy chief. I said, I do, sir. And he goes, he wants you to come to special operations. I told him I hate to lose you, but, you know, when the deputy chief calls you, you got to let him go. He just shook my hand. He said, I wish you the best. Take care of yourself and be careful and this and that. Classy guy. And that was how long after you got back to the 7th District? About a year and a half, probably. Thank you for listening, and make sure you're following us so you know the instant Conversation 5 drops. 